Here's a couple of my favorite games, Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie. This series has become sort of symbolic of Rare's Golden Age. Fans have been begging for a sequel for almost 20 years. Will that ever happen? Maybe. But until then, we'll just have to make do with these two games. So, let's talk about them. And I'm going to start with Kazooie first because I'm not some masochist that plays games out of order. Right away, I really like this game's intro. It sets the tone pretty well. We meet our villain, Gruntilda, who's a rhyming witch. She wants to be the most beautiful woman in the land, so she kidnaps Banjo's sister, Tootie, because she wants to steal her beauty and transfer it to herself. Which can't happen if you get a game over. Yeah, you can bet this version of Grunty has inspired a bit of fan art. But in all seriousness, a damsel in distress story is kinda lame. I do like Grunty's motivation though, right away you can tell she's incredibly vain. She carved her face into the side of a mountain for God's sake. So here's our two protagonists. Banjo's a bear and he's pretty laid back. Kazooie's a sarcastic bird that lives in his backpack. They're a pretty unlikely duo, but somehow it feels like a pretty natural pairing. What I think is kinda cool is that they start off the game knowing absolutely no abilities whatsoever. You have to learn your moves from a mole called Bottles as you make your way through the game. I like this, it gives you a nice sense of progression. Banjo and Kazooie have to work together to perform these moves. It's the power of teamwork. There's been a lot of comparisons between this game and Super Mario 64. They're both 3D platformers where you have to do tasks and solve puzzles to collect golden trinkets to unlock new worlds. Except this time they're jigsaw pieces called Jiggies that you fit into puzzles. A lot of people like to argue which is the better game. Well, I'd say Mario 64 beats Banjo in one regard. Its gameplay is better. Mario is just a lot more versatile than Banjo. Banjo's moves can feel a bit stiff at times. He just doesn't control as well. That's not to say he controls badly, it's just that Mario controls way better. But other than that, I think Banjo took everything else that Mario established and did it 10 times better. The world of Banjo-Kazooie feels much more alive. What I mean is, in Mario, you learn your moves from a signpost. In Banjo, you learn your moves from an actual character. Banjo's world is full of personality. I think that's why it's so endearing to a lot of people. The characters you meet are all pretty fun, and you meet a lot of them. Every single new level you visit has at least one new NPC to talk to. I especially like the game's hub world too, which is Gruntilda's lair. It's just a really magical place that you could imagine a witch would inhabit. The dialogue is also pretty funny. How's your nuts, Spark Breath? You just don't see lines like that too often nowadays. Banjo can also get transformed into various creatures by the local shaman Mumbo Jumbo. These transformations help Banjo get into areas he couldn't normally get to. Besides that though, the transformations are kinda useless. But I will say the coolest one is the alligator. It's the only one with an attack, and it's the only one with a minigame. One where you have to eat more than another alligator named Mr. Vile. There's something I need to address, and that's the fact that this game is a so-called collectathon. This one word seems to leave a bad taste in people's mouths, and I don't get why. Collecting stuff isn't an inherently bad idea. I'd understand that if you had to go out of your way to collect stuff, that would probably get annoying. A lot of people like to bring up Donkey Kong 64 as an example of that. And I agree, Donkey Kong 64 can be a bit tedious. But does that mean this whole genre is flawed because one game is? Well, is the FPS genre bad just because Daikatana exists? No, that would be dumb. Likewise, the collecting here is actually a good thing, in my opinion. You don't have to go out of your way to collect everything unless you really want to. The game is built around exploring the levels, so you're bound to pick up mostly everything anyway. There are hidden pickups, like these little creatures called Jinjos that you have to get in each world, but you'll usually just come across them anyway. And they make noise. Maybe people have a problem with the fact there's a hundred musical notes in each level that you have to get. They unlock new parts of Grunty's lair. But again, you're bound to just pick them all up anyway while you're exploring the world. They actually make for a nice marker for where you've been. See, they serve a real purpose. The only problem is if you die or leave the level and come back, they all respawn and you have to get them again. That's really annoying. Yeah, I hate that stupid tree you have to climb. Not one playthrough where I don't fall off this goddamn piece of shit. Let's go over the level design. Each level is pretty simple and most follow a simple formula. You have one big central landmark and the level is based around that. Like here in Mad Monster Mansion, the landmark is... 
well, the mansion. I also like how most of these levels have some sort of connection with Gruntilda, which makes sense considering they're accessible through her lair. Like how Grunty owns Mad Monster Mansion, and she owns the ship in Rusty Bucket Bay. It makes the world feel a bit more thought out to me, except a lot of places have absolutely nothing to do with her. Like, what is she going to do in the desert of Gobi's Valley? Go on an archaeology hunt? Maybe, but probably not. I think the graphics hold up pretty nicely too. Yeah, it's low poly and the textures are tiny, but so what? Good art design is good art design. If you said this game was ugly, I'd call you a liar. There's more to graphics than just polygon count. I've seen modern games that just look hideous. Banjo's cartoony art style remains pretty appealing. The sound design is pretty good too. They couldn't fit voice files into the cartridge, so all the characters have unique mumbles whenever they talk instead. The music is probably my favorite aspect of the game. I think the composer, Grant Kirkhope, was born just to work on this one game. His style fits this game perfectly. I could point out all my favorite songs, but that would mean I'd have to play the entire soundtrack. So I'll just mention a cool feature of the music instead. It will change instruments depending on what area you're in. Most notably, the theme to Grunny's Lair will change to a level's instruments when you approach that level. When you get close to the end of the game, Grunty will make you do a giant quiz show, Grunty's Furnace Fun, before she'll give you 2D back. I don't know why she does this, I guess she just loves quizzing people. You have to answer general knowledge of the game. Like what level is this screenshot from? What's this character's name? What song is this from? That sort of thing. I think a lot of people hate this part, but I love it. I love the game, so the fact that I get to use all this useless trivia knowledge is pretty fun. I'd do the whole board if that didn't take an astronomical amount of time. Winning this quiz means you get 2D back, which was your entire goal of the game, so of course Banjo and Kazooie just give up chasing Grunty and throw a party. Except 2D comes up and gives them a hard time until they go back and finally confront her. Here you reach the deepest part of Grunty's lair, which is pretty spooky. I like the atmosphere here. It very much feels like you've made it to the end of the game. Here's the final boss fight with Gruntilda. I think it might be my favorite final boss of any game. Just look at this atmosphere. You're at the top of a tower, there's fog and lightning in the background, and you've got this great music track to pump you up. And Grunty will totally kick your ass too if you let her. Despite the fact she's pretty goofy, there's a reason why she's the villain of the game. I also liked how the entire game was building to this moment. Well duh Brad, I hear you say. It is the final boss. Well, throughout the entire game, you don't really get to interact with Grunty herself. You see her in cutscenes, you see statues of her, you see pictures, you can see her at the end of the furnace fun, and she'll taunt you throughout the game. But she herself is always just out of reach. You getting here and fighting her is really satisfying. I think it's kind of interesting that Banjo himself doesn't hit Grunty with the final blow, because she's put an impenetrable protection spell around herself. You actually get help from the Jinjos, proving that they weren't just a useless collectible after all. The mighty Jinjinator is summoned and he knocks Grunty off her lair, where she's then trapped under a rock. Tootie is finally satisfied and Mumbo shows up and leaves a sequel hook for Banjo Tooie. Pretty ballsy of Rare to assume they get to do a sequel, but I guess it paid off. Let's talk about Tooie now. It's actually my preferred one of the two games, which seems like a controversial opinion. Kazooie is revered while Tui gets a lot more criticism, but I think it's a lot better. To me, Tui is everything I'd ever want in a sequel. It takes everything that the original did, but ramps it up even more. Mumbo says Tui makes Kazooie look like a joke, and I agree with him. So it's been two years since the first game, and Grunty is still trapped under her rock. Her assistant, Klungo, has been unsuccessful in moving it. 
So her sisters Mangella and Blabelda come to finally save her. In those two years she's decomposed, and she's a spooky skeleton in addition to being a witch now. She immediately takes revenge on Banjo and Kazooie by destroying their house. She also accidentally kills Bottles. Her scheme this time is to suck the life out of the land so she can restore her body. I think this plot is much better than the original. For one thing, it's not just some rehashed damsel in distress story. It's a logical continuation from the first game. It also has much higher stakes. If you don't stop Grunty in time, she'll zombify everything. One thing I hate about the game though is Grunty's sisters make her stop rhyming. Come on, Rare. Were you that lazy to think of new rhymes? You get to keep all your moves from the previous game, and they actually improve the control quite a bit. The moves feel a bit more fluid when you perform them. But just because the old moves are back doesn't mean this game doesn't have a ton more for you to learn. This time you get your moves from Bottle's brother, Jam Jars. The most significant is the power to split up. You think this would mean you no longer have the power of teamwork, but a lot of times you still need Banjo and Kazooie to work together to solve puzzles. So it's still teamwork, just a different kind of teamwork. I can't believe Kazooie's running on water here. Who does she think she is, Jesus Christ? The transformations have also been improved. This time you're transformed by a girl named Humba Wumba instead of Mumbo. Mumbo's actually a playable character who can go around performing magic to help the main duo in various ways. All the transformations have attacks now, and there's a lot more for them to do compared to the first game. Wait a minute. Car? Car? Car! Also, you get to play as a T-Rex. That's all I'm saying. The graphics and music are pretty much the same quality as the first game. Well, actually, Tui's graphics are a bit better. It has some impressive lighting effects for the N64, and everything has an actual shadow instead of just a blob. Also, this game somehow has built-in widescreen and surround sound. Usually for old games like these, I'd have to hack widescreen in, but not here. Tui also has one music track that I think is just beautiful. The Atlantis theme. Tui has so many new features and improvements, I dare say Banjo-Kazooie looks like a tech demo compared to it. Each level has at least one minigame, and each level also has a big boss fight. Besides Gruntilda, I think Banjo-Kazooie had like, one boss fight. There's also first-person shooter segments, but I don't like those too much. They're all just giant mazes that I get lost in. And in most of these, you have to find a bunch of objects under a time limit. Ugh. The cast list is even bigger than Kazooie's. Now, of course, most of these guys aren't that fleshed out, but I really like exploring new levels and meeting new characters. The world feels even more alive in this game. Now, speaking of the worlds, this is one aspect of the game that a lot of people have a problem with. The levels are a lot bigger and more complex than Kazooie's. If Kazooie's levels were a sandbox, Tui's levels would be a whole beach. The levels are all interconnected too. Which allows for backtracking and sometimes forward tracking. I think some people have a problem with this, but I think it just makes travel between the worlds easier. I mean, this game does give you a lot of shortcuts. And despite the levels being much bigger, there's a lot less collecting because most items can be found grouped together in nests. I think this makes note collecting really lame. Like, they're so easy to get and they don't respawn. Why even have them? Well, the collectathon haters should be happy. But anyway, a lot of people think these levels are too big. I disagree though. This is an N64 game for god's sake. The levels are microscopic compared to what we have now. Though I do tend to get lost in Glitter Gulch Mine. Because everything looks the same. I think the real problem are the Jiggies themselves. Now there's only 90 Jiggies in the game compared to the 100 in Kazooie, but the amount of effort it takes to get one has increased exponentially. Let's look at one example. Here's Grunny Industries, considered by many to be the most complex level in the game. There's a Jiggy that's sitting here on this giant fan, which blows you away anytime you try to get near it. So how do you get it? Well, you go fight the boss of the level, Weldar, and he'll break the fan's fuse box. You can walk over to it and get it. But before you can even fight the boss, you have to unlock his door. So you need to transform into a washer, which lets you activate the button that opens the door. But you also have to disable the giant magnet, which will pull you away from the button, so you need Mumbo to do that. But Mumbo can only do magic on a Mumbo pad, and you have to unscrew it from the upper floor so it'll fall down so Mumbo can use it. But you can't even get into the magnet room unless you put a battery in its door, which means you'll need to split up Banjo Kazooie, because Banjo needs space in his backpack to put the battery. But you can't even get into Grunny Industries unless you open this train station and then travel there from another station. And to unlock the train, you need to defeat the boss of Glitter Gulch Mine, Old King Cole, which means you'll need to get Mumbo to rerail the train because the fight takes place in spoiler. And you need to do all this to get one Jiggy. In Banjo Kazooie, you poop some eggs into a flower pot, and that gives you a Jiggy. 
Oh sweet god. Almost every JG later in the game is like this. It's kind of overwhelming. So let's fast forward and face Grunny again instead. She has another quiz show, The Tower of Tragedy. This time you compete with Grunny's sisters, who she kills when they lose. Grunny is kind of hardcore. When you win, you get to save Bottles and the Jinjo King. Then it's off to face Grunny again. The final boss fight is even harder than Banjo-Kazooie's. Grunny has this giant mechanical digger, the Hag-1. And she'll keep quizzing you while you fight her. I can just barely beat her. Though, maybe I just suck at this fight. I don't know. When you defeat her, the Hag-1 blows up and she's reduced to just a skull. She also leaves a sequel hook for Banjo-3. Pretty ballsy of Rare to assume they get to do a sequel, and I guess it didn't pay off. Let's see, am I forgetting anything? Oh yeah, Stop and Swap. The greatest gaming mystery of all time. One that wasn't supposed to be a mystery. So throughout Banjo-Kazooie, you'd find areas that sort of stuck out but had no real purpose. The most interesting was this ice key locked behind a nice wall. If you got 100 Jiggies, Mumbo revealed that these locations could be accessed and they contained items that would be used in Banjo-Tooie. Hackers revealed in all that there were six mystery eggs in addition to the ice key. They figured out you could enter lengthy cheat codes, which gave you access to the items. When collected, they opened a new menu called Stop and Swap. When Tui rolled around, the way you got the items was by smashing Banjo-Kazooie carts. You didn't revisit old areas or anything. The fanbase did a collective, huh? And wondered what the hell was going on. Theories spread for years of what Stop and Swap was supposed to be. They begged Rare for answers, but they remained tight-lipped. The common theory was that Sob and Swap was supposed to unlock something amazing. Something incredible. The items in Tui gave you some lame prizes. Jinjo and multiplayer? Who cares? The only cool one was what the Ice Key unlocked, a transformation for Kazooie that turned her into a dragon. Eventually, Rare opened up. The explanation was that they could exploit the N64's RAM to transfer data between two games. You'd be able to get the items in Kazooie and transfer them to Tui. The RAM held data for a little while after the game was shut off. Now, evidently, Nintendo revised the hardware so this was no longer possible, and they told Rare they couldn't implement the system for fear that kids would damage their game somehow. So, Rare put a bandage on the situation with those cop-out cartridges in Tui. So it's a shame this feature never got implemented correctly, it would have been cool. But still, the theories were pretty fun on their own. So that's Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie. Maybe one day we'll get Banjo-3. But until then, we'll just have to keep playing these ones. What about nuts and bolts? Ah, 